Hi everyone, it's me again, Dr. Samina Rahman, Gyno Girl. Today, actually, I wanna talk about a topic that came up recently when I was interviewed about, um, and also I've been DM'd about this issue as well as um, you know patients have asked. And so for me, I like to bring up, uh, if it brings up an opportunity to educate about um, female sexual function and dysfunction, then I'm gonna jump on it. So, um, and you know, I like to bust myths and break stereotypes. So today we're gonna talk about blue vulva. Let's do it. Hi guys, it's me, Gyno Girl. So today I wanted to talk about an issue that's come up. I was um, interviewed about it and um, some patients have asked me about it and I was had some DMs about it as well. So um, it's the whole idea of the blue vulva, <laughs> which maybe you guys are wondering what. So I guess there was apparently a, um, a viral video on TikTok. Now I'm not on TikTok. My, um, even though I love to entertain and I love to dance and I, I could really get sucked into watching a lot of TikTok if I was given the opportunity. I try not to get on it because, um, you know, between, you know, my busy life and trying to maintain like my in real life social experiences, then, you know, it would really obstruct that if I was on, on TikTok for too long because I would just get really absorbed in it. But anyway, um, I guess there was a video that came out and it was um, about a, a guy that was describing like how blue balls weren't um and it's really painful for guys and how actually like men use that as an excuse you know to persuade women to have intercourse with them which i'm thinking duh like of course they do <laughs> but um you know uh and they shouldn't and so the thing is um that brought up the uh, a whole discussion about you know the concept of blue vulva and if it exists so like i said i like to um demystify topics um and shatter some myths and also educate because we don't talk that much about like you know this um about sex and um the process of arousal and all that stuff and the functioning and dysfunctioning that occurs with that so that's what we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the blue vulva so i mean this is actually my vulva puppet that i use a lot in my office it's um it does happen to have a bluish hue to it. Um, I think I got it from one of the conferences I attended. I purchased it um, from, I think it was a Volvolutionary. But anyway, so let's just review a little bit of anatomy, um, which we're gonna, I'm gonna do a video about as well. But um, so we have that, you know, um, external genitals, which include your labia majora, your labia minora, there's your clitoral hood, there's your clitoris, your urethra, the vagina, you can see it goes, and it stops right here. That would be where your cervix would come up, I guess. And then um, um, with the, you know, you have the clitoris, like I said, the labia minora. Um, between the labia minora and the entry right around here is your vestibule, the vulvar vestibule, which is the area between um, the labia minora, inner labia minora, where your hymenal remnant is all the way up to the urethra. Um, and that's an area that we're going to discuss too at some point when we talk about vestibulodynia and painful sex. So this is our anatomy. Um, and to kind of understand what happens, you have to understand the anatomy um, and how it's analogous to men because for blue balls or epididymal hypertension, that's um, for individuals with, you know, uh, testicles. I'm talking about individuals that have vulvas and vaginas and clitorises. So, um, the vulva in general, but you know, you have your labia, the clitoris and the vagina all um, have, um, uh, especially the external vulva has um, androgen receptors and needs testosterone, needs estrogen, they need, they needs hormones to keep itself functional. And so there's the process of um, arousal that occurs and um, we can talk about sort of um, genital arousal, but also subjective arousal. Um, for uh, f most of us in sexual medicine, believe, you know, we think of the brain as the biggest sexual organ. When the brain actually communicates with the rest of the body, there's a lot of things happening. You have neurotransmitters that um, are important for sexual function, such as norepinephrine. Um, you have dopamine that's important. You have hormones like testosterone, estrogen, progesterone that are important. 
Um, you have other chemicals released in cells like nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. All these things are important for the process of um, you know, arousal. And so, uh, like I said, there's subjective arousal where you know, the mind is sort of engaged um, based on the sexual stimuli. And then there's genital arousal that occurs. And this occurs once you get the stimuli. And what happens is you get um, a rush of blood that goes to the, the arteries feeding, um, basically an opening up of the arteries that feed the, this external area. So you have vasodilation or an opening of these arteries. So a rush of blood happens. The veins, the veins are usually what drains stuff away from an organ. So they constrict, right? So then the blood is just left to accumulate there. And so we have what we have called vasocongestion or pelvic congestion or curse. And this is the process where you see genital arousal happening. So you have the stimuli that occurs from sensory arousal, the genitals respond. <clears throat> you have labia that increases in size. Um, the clitoris increases in size. The vagina lengthens. The pelvic floor muscles relax. This is all getting ready for the process of intercourse. In this same process, what you experience is sort of a throbbing, um, a pulsing sensation. Um, some people will, will call it, um, uh, you know, an increase in the swelling. At the same time, this is happening with the, with the dilation of the vessels and the constriction of the veins. You have um, your uh, glands are opening up and allowing excretion of all the things that keep with, around. You have the glands in the vulvar area and else in the vagina you have that are secreting the mucin and it allows for the moisture. So just think WAP, <laughs> wet ass privates. Anyway, so you have this WAP situation happening in the vagina and the externally you have swelling happening. You have an engorgement basically, which is similarly what happens with men, right? And so in the, that sense, because they call it blue because you know, um, this is an accumulation of blood. And so the vasocongestion is usually um, like blue in color. And so that's why people call it the blue vulva. And so, you know, most of us in sexual medicine think of arousal and orgasm in one area. So an orgasm is like an extension of the arousal um, period of time. Um, and of note, while this is happening in the genitals, you know, systemically you have stuff happening like your blood pressure going up, you have your temperature going up, your heart rate going up. Um, you may have your nipples becoming erect, your pupil, pupils are dilating. So all these things are happening as you're getting excited. Um, and so if you don't get to the next point, which is the extension of arousal, which is orgasm or climax, you know, you just continuously will have some sensitivity in the clitoris area you'll have still this bulging, this throbbing, this pulsatile sensation down here. And so it's not really painful, but maybe a little uncomfortable uh, and it dissipates on its own if you don't do anything about it. So say you're not ready for intercourse and you don't wanna be persuaded into it, obviously, because you know, that's your decision to do when you want. Um, or if um, uh, you know, um, you're not able to love yourself at the end of it, then, um, you know, eventually the blood will flow out and you will have, you know, normalization of your, of your physiology. So like I said, you know, systemically you have the other changes happening, the heart rate rising, the, the blood pressure rising, you have your temperature rising, you have your pupils dilating, the nipples might become erect. All these things are happening in response to a sexual stimuli. Um, and, you know, eventually, you know, if you decide to go to the next level and, you know, complete intercourse or, you know, um, try to reach orgasm, which I said, you know, we all think of it as an extension of arousal, then all the blood gets released. Now, if um, you're not ready for it, or, you know, it's not something that you can do or want to do, or, um, or you know, um, or in that particular situation, then you can always go and love yourself and, you know, complete, your own, complete it on your own through masturbation. If that's not something that you're able to do or want to do, then you can take some cold um, ice packs and stick it over your genitals. Um, if you don't have access to that, but you're able to go take a cold shower, you can do that. If uh, none of that works over time, resting or try to visualize something that is like not remotely a turn on for you. Um, so try to think of something that does not sexually stimulate you to try to decompress things down there. 
And so that's the whole idea of the basically what's happening with arousal. And if you don't get to to um, orgasm, then you kind of are just left with these feelings, this throbbing sensation, sensitivity of the clitoral area, that kind of thing, until it dissipates on its own and the blood is released. Um, it's not dangerous. It's not um, you know life threatening or a medical emergency by any means either for men or women. Um, but because we're talking about it, it gives me a good opportunity to kind of discuss, uh, you know, when we should think about seeking help and when we should think about looking into um, uh, medical um, uh, expert opinions and uh, also evaluations. So I, that's what the next thing I want to say is that you know, um, if you do have an issue of not being able to achieve an orgasm or not, um, you know, through normal s stimulation that occurs um, and it's bothersome to you, you know, whatever way you normally achieve orgasm, whether it's clitoral, vaginal, whatever, and you're starting to notice it impacts your relationship, it's causing you distress, then you may have an orgasmic disorder and there's definitely things that we can do to help you. And so that's one time I would say like try to find a sexual medicine specialist that can kind of aid you in this because we can do a full evaluation um, we can work with you in different uh, with working with different neurotransmitters and uh, hormones and other things full exams you really need a detailed exam um, especially considering you know, really you should get a full detailed exam not only the clitoral area but really in the pelvic floor muscles too because that's you know the gist of you know the orgasm is happening a lot of times not only in the the pelvic floor muscles. With those contractions, you know, you have uterine contractions, you have cervical um, and then clitoral. So those are things that need to be looked at if you are having uh, what we call female orgasmic disorder. You can also have arousal disorders that occur. So, um, you know, either you're getting distressed by not able to have genital arousal or sensory arousal, and then you should also seek some um, uh, evaluation from a specialist in sexual medicine. And speaking of disorders of arousal, um, I'm gonna do a whole topic on what's called persistent genital arousal disorder, but it is you know, um, something that I see in my office, not infrequently, even though we probably estimate maybe you know, 3% of women probably have it. Maybe it's more than that, but because not that many people know of it and they're not aware of it. Um, but it's basically um, persistent arousal in the genital area, not from sexual stimulation. It's unwanted, it's intrusive, um, it um, causes distress. It's almost like you're feeling like you're on the verge of an orgasm, but you have no sexual interest or thoughts. And it could, and this is something that's kind of persistent for people and might last, uh, and, it, and, for, and actually to have the disorder, it should last for up to six months. Um, and it's very distressing and, and people that have this, um, you know, either in, we look at, you know, um, the different areas that are impacted by arousal and orgasm. Um, and so we're talking about, you know, end organs, we're talking about the brain, we're talking about the spine. Um, but there's potentially an issue in any of those categories. I'm going to, like I said, do a video on PGAD, which is persistent genital arousal disorder. But because I have you here and I'm talking to you about blue vulva and arousal, I wanted to mention that it, it is a problem out there. It exists. I treat it. Um, it's very difficult to treat in some patients, but um, there is hope and there's help. So, and that's the same case for like arousal and orgasm disorders in general. So I want you to realize that we do, we, we are making headway in this area in sexual medicine. And if you are experiencing these difficulties, you should definitely see a sexual medicine specialist. Um, and we can work with you and we can try to get to the bottom of it. So, that's all I have to say today about the blue vulva. <laughs> I hope you learned a little bit um, and I hope you learned also that you don't have, you know, obviously if, if you're not wanting to complete um, a sexual encounter, you don't, you don't have to. Um, and so that's it here for Gyno Girl. I just wanted to react to that and let you guys know that this was something that came up. So see you later, Gyno Girl out. Please like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks.